Yeah, 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 yeah. What's up, everybody? It is your boy, BQ, with your Impact Lounge Impact Review. It's pretty late here on Saturday. It's 11 p.m. Pacific time, so I know it's one of those uh, one of those evenings where the majority of the listeners are asleep, but um, we are knocking out this live stream anyway, and we're going to get a pop, and we're going to talk. Impact, of course, going to review this last episode that uh, was a lot better than last week's, in my opinion. I thought this was was really, really good. We'll see what the go-home show brings. The go-home shows are typically not my favorite episodes. I think that is an area that the company struggles in. And even if you look at the card next week, there's not a lot of like Bound for Glory implications. They tend to like throw all these random matches that have nothing to do with the people actually wrestling on the card. So it's kind of strange, but we'll see. You know, uh, We'll see what happens when it's, when it's on. Uh, first things first, I've been saying this the last couple of weeks. I am getting married next weekend. I'm getting married the day after Bound for Glory. So I will not be, I'll be out of town, uh, back home in California. So that being said, even though I will be watching Bound for Glory, I will not be live streaming directly after it. I will be reviewing the show a couple days later. So Monday, hopefully no later than Tuesday, but, um, you know, I'll be back. I'll be back Wednesday. I mean, not Wednesday, excuse me. Uh, I'll be back Monday, and I hope to review it in the evening. So you will not be getting a Bound for Glory live stream. I did an upload on the channel earlier today uh, talking about Billy Corgan's his, uh, his system where he's re- re- um, reviving the territories. So I did quite a lot, quite a long mini upload on that. And, you know, basically, um, I guess what I'm pointing at is that Billy Corgan and NWA does seem to have a system to, to find the next young star, you know, or to, to, uh, you know, they're creating a feeder system to strengthen their company. I question if impact has anything like that in place. And I think that they missed an opportunity during the Twitch era to do something very, very similar to that. So, um, but I said in the beginning of that mini podcast that I'm actually going to be reviewing their Sawin pay-per-view here on the Negative BQ channel on the 28th of October. So that is a day of their pay-per-view. So I'm going to be doing an NWA review. I understand that the majority of the listeners here on the channel may not follow that company. But that was one of the reasons for the, you know, the rebrand I did with my channel is that I didn't want to be in that impact box 24-7 if I wanted to talk about something else. I was going to. So um, if it's your first time checking me out, welcome here. Hope you consider subscribing to the channel. Give it a thumbs up, comment, all of those good things. I'm an Impact fan. I'm an Impact critic. You're going to hear me nitpick and talk about the smallest details of the show when I do these reviews. Some people like it. Some people don't like it. I'm negative BQ for a reason, right? Um, but, that, but that's just what I do. I was talk, talking last week that, you know, part of it comes from a military ba- background, um, noticing the small details, but you know, I'm a fan. I review the show from the standpoint of almost a casual fan. Like I, when I, when I'm watching impact or I'm watching any wrestling show, I put myself in the fans' shoes, in the fans' seat on the sofa. Even though I do the wrestling YouTube thing, I am not someone who reads the dirt sheets. I don't read spoilers. I don't read any kind of news sites. I don't listen to a whole lot of wrestling podcasts, which is kind of weird, right? Because most podcasters do all those things. So when there's the news about, you know, Tony Khan did this and this and Vince McMahon did this and this and we're selling this and the TV rights this and I give two shits. I've never cared about that kind of stuff. I just watch wrestling as a fan and and I podcast. So I see it through different eyes than most um, most podcasters do because they're they're just they've always got the news in the back of their head and who's supposed to who's coming and who's going and uh you know, this person's scheduled for a push. Like, I don't really care about that stuff. So, um, you know, because I kind of have that fan 
mindset and the mindset. I always try to have the mindset of someone watching the show for the first time, whether they're watching impact for the first time or watching wrestling for the first time. So I do look at those small details that I think would turn somebody off, you know? So, you know, I, I'm, I'm only breaking that down for the people who are checking me out for the first time. We got a couple of people here uh, joining the live stream. I know we're, I know we're rocking a little bit late tonight, but uh, thanks for, Checking in. Let me pull the comments up so that I'm able to see them. All right, cool. So we're going to get into this episode right here. I said at the top of the show, this was a lot better than last week's. Last week, I thought um, it had it had its moments. There were some some parts of the show people really liked, and there were some show uh, parts of the show people really hated. I thought they bounced back a little bit this week. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I got to. I got to talk about before I get into this episode. I left my notes in my car, so I'm unfortunately kind of have to go off the top of my head here. But uh, it's too late for me to go outside and go to the car. I'm just I'm just kind of being lazy or whatever. So I'm going to assume there's nothing else I was supposed to talk about. We're going to get um, right into this. But I do want to reiterate, uh, along with Bound for Glory, not reviewing it right after the show. The actual episode of Impact that happens on Thursday, I'm not reviewing at all. The Go Home Show, there's going to be no review for that whatsoever because uh, Thursday is actually the day I'm heading to California, and then I will be back Monday. So I'm not doing a honeymoon right after, um, just going to California for what I got to do, uh, tie the knot, head back the day after. So uh, we'll not have my podcasting equipment with me out there. I have no intention on bringing it. And then by the time I come back, you know, Bound for Glory is going to be wrapped up. So we're just going to talk uh, Bound for Glory and just go home episode. You're just going to have to uh, listen to some of these other uh, podcasts out there. So let's get into this opening match here real quick. Swig of coffee. Opening match was the Rascals, Trey Miguel and Zachary Wentz versus Rich Swan and Sammy Callahan. They could not wait to get Sammy Callahan out of this company. They said, hey, we're going to give you the first match, and uh, and then bye-bye. They, already, they have already taken Sammy off of the website. So I'm just curious what is going on there exactly. Like Clearly, they, they left him on um, because he was still going to be on the episode, but they took him off, I mean, immediately. And it's almost like the company gave very little shits about him because the picture they had up, they, they never updated. It was, he had hair. Um, it, it was like a, it was an OVE picture. You know what I mean? And it's just weird because they've updated other people on the roster, on the roster page. So I wonder, um, you know, cause I was talking about a couple of weeks ago, Sammy was someone who identified himself as wanting to be one of the faces of the company. And I don't think the company saw it that way because he never had any, title runs anything meaningful he was the world champion but that was just to drop it to tessa blanchard that wasn't because they felt like uh you know he should get a run with the world title he was, he was a transitional champion so to speak but no tag team titles no x division nothing you know he was just he was a good soldier and at this point who knows what's next for him i don't see him anywhere else i don't see you know, he's too old for like the NXT system. Um, it would be a huge step down to try to do Ring of Honor stuff. I don't think uh, AEW would pick him up. He might just want to do the indie thing full time, and that might be what's best for him. I honestly think NWA would be a pretty decent lateral move for him. I could see him doing some MLW dates. But I think uh, NWA would be a great lateral move for him because they're doing the territory systems. He can get in on that with with uh, Revolver Pro. I think that's the name of his company, right? He can get in on that, you know. So, um, I think that I think that would be a good move. I don't see him moving on to a bigger company, and it's going to be interesting to see does Havoc stick around or does Havoc bounce too? You know, it seems like they're still trying to do something with the Death Doll stuff storyline wise. So, I don't know, but this opening match here. I don't think Tom, Tom said it was a first time ever matchup. I don't believe so. I think these uh, these guys have wrestled once in the past. This was a really great opening 
match. Very good. And I've always pointed out that a good impact episode has great bookends, has something hot at the beginning, something hot at the end. And that typically means we're getting a pretty good show. I still, I probably talk about this every week. I still think kicking off the show with the highlights uh, with we on the night and everything. I think they waste a lot of time. They didn't waste as much time this week, but they wasted a full four minutes last week. You know, um, I, I, I do believe they should just start with the action very quickly. And when the storyline needs those highlights later, then you, then we can do that. But it's, it's, you know, every single week, C4 spike, same shit every week. You know what I mean? So, um, I would like to have seen this just just kick off with these fools in the ring, grab the viewers immediately, and keep them. Don't give them a, an excuse to go away. But as I said, this was really, really good. The only issue I had with this match is that they pulled an AEW on us. There was a spot at the very end where... I don't even remember which of the rascals spray painted the other one inadvertently. And then Sammy gets, gets the, you know, the other rat, the rascal who got sprayed in position for cactus driver 97. And by the way, his whole thumbs up, thumbs down thing has always bothered. It, it bothers me. Any wrestler who wastes time before hitting a move. When I was growing up as a kid, let's just say Jake, the snake Roberts was going for the DDT. Like, the guy would be on the ground, and then Jake would hit him with the with the sign for the DDT. He would let the crowd know. Um, I'm trying to think some other wrestlers that just had similar signals that they would give hand hand gestures that they were going for their finisher. But they typically did these things when the opponent was on their ass, laying on the ground. Like Jake did not pick the guy up, put him in a front headlock, and then signal for the DDT because you're wasting time. Um, and it's, it was always painful to me how long it took Sammy to do a thumbs up, thumbs down. Same with Petey Williams, you know, doing this for the, uh, Canadian destroyer. Uh, but it's whatever it's uh, irrelevant at this point. Cause this is his last match. But anyway, he gets him for the cactus driver. Rich Swan jumps to the top rope and they do a spike fucking pile driver. Now this is Sammy's finish. Okay, which clearly they didn't feel the need to protect because he's on his way out of the company, even though there's another wrestler on the damn roster who uses the pile driver. But they do a spike cactus driver and then he kicks out. I thought that was a real AEW move because that's one thing about Impact's matches. They do not overdo it with the near falls, the covers, the super finishers. They don't kick out of everything. Impact probably has the best logical wrestling in the world. I, as much as I sit here and talk about we own the night and the same graphics for 10 years and the red lights everywhere and or Tom had a first time matchup, even though I'm like talking about that shit nonstop, the actual wrestling on the show is the most logical wrestling there is. It's the most believable so when I say that at the top of the show, that sometimes, you know, I, I just not sometimes all the time. I just watch through the eyes of the casual fan or just the fan in general, the wrestling fan in general. I I see the show and I see the storytelling in a ring making a lot of sense and not doing anything off the wall. You know, they're not doing like AEW where you could light someone on fire and they still kick out a two, you know. So I was really disappointed with this. And this is what one of the reasons that. I never got super into Ring of Honor because they did a lot of that. It took, you know, three or four finishers in a row and finishers off the top rope to like finally beat somebody. They just kicked out of everything. So that really disappointed me with this. Uh, because after that, um, seemingly out of nowhere, the Rascals have the upper hand again. You know, Wentz or Miguel, whoever is, is no, no longer blind. And they go, they hit their flash, whatever finisher, which is, kind of a bullshit finish you know it's it's cool for the effect but it's one of those moves that you should probably hit him with a very um, impactful move before that 
and I'm, I'm trying to think of a good example. Um, you know, so, okay, I'm going to give you the example of The Rock, okay? There was a lot of the times when The Rock wrestled that he would hit you with, um, you know, I, I knew I know he used the spine buster a lot, but there was times he hit you with The Rock bottom, which was the move that really beat you, and then he hit you with the people's elbow after, you know, because that was just a flashy move. And the way The Rascals won this match, the move was 20 times weaker than the freaking pile driver, you know, you know what I'm saying? So, but anyway, the rascals win this shit. And I do got to say, I think they're doing a good job with, with the rascals right now. They, um, they got real heat on them the other day when they had them, you know, beat Uemura, who was trying to get his job back, you know, impact pulled the trigger, had them beat him. Um, and and get the heat, you know what I mean? And then, you know, here, uh, Sammy Callahan puts him over on the way out. They're cheating all the time. And Tom Haver's like, they're cheated every single time. They're doing it. They're doing a good job making this like a, a legit heel tag team because these are guys we like. You know, they were very popular as baby faces. But Impact's doing a great job um, with them. I... Hope they keep the titles for a while. I'm bored when ABC has them. Um, I don't see. I just don't see anyone else on the roster right now that should hold them. So I hope that uh, they keep going with the Rascals because they're doing really good work as a heel team, much better than I feel they ever did as a as a, a, a babyface team the first time around in Impact. So yeah, we get the Rascals for the win, and they're heading uh, to Bound for Glory. The, the, you know, I talked about this last week too, was the match was kind of unnecessary. I understand they were trying to get Sammy to do business on the way out the door, but the champions having to wrestle for the right to defend their titles at Bound for Glory, was this match necessary? I just, from a, from that, like kind of storytelling standpoint, I don't understand that. That's not something wrestling companies do a whole lot, but I've noticed in this past year, that's become a champions defend the title and if they win they can move on to the pay-per-view like they they deserve to go on to the freaking pay-per-view um i do think rich swan is the next one gone whenever his contract is up which will actually piss me off a lot because he's one of my favorites but i i think he would i i see him doing whatever sammy callahan's doing i know in the in the chat here it says sammy could reunite with moxley i guess they're very good friends i don't see it I don't see, I do not see it. I don't think Sammy is what they're looking for in AEW. I don't even think Rich Swan is, which is kind of unfortunate because they, they do a lot with smaller wrestlers, but I, I don't know why I just don't see that fit. I could see them both doing, as I said, some uh, MLW stuff for a bit. I can see them doing NWA stuff and I could see maybe, maybe Rich Swan goes all in on, on, doing the indies with Sammy. I don't know, but I, my gut tells me Rich Swan is the, the next to leave. They just haven't really, they, they had, they haven't done a lot with him since he was a champion, you know, um, pull up this comment here. Cause this is a long comment and I can't read it while I'm talking impact killed Bravo and Taya went to prison for murder. Never mind all the magic and alternate dimension nonsense. They have a man wrestling in the women's division. So, um, I'm a big Giselle Shaw fan, so I'm not going to really uh, talk about that last part. But other than that, um, the one who was doing all this, who killed Bravo and the, you know, like killing people and going to different dimensions and realms and shit, that was, I believe, Jimmy Jacobs. I think Jimmy Jacobs is um, really overrated as a creative wrestling mind. Because he did the, you know, he struck gold with the list of Jericho once upon a time. There's been nothing he's been involved in since that, um, that I think was good. I mean, I don't, I don't know how else to word it. Like, I think everything he he did with Impact was was bad. I mean, when he left, we stopped. You know, people were getting killed, and uh, you know, the undead undead realm stuff, and you know, he was the guy behind all that. And, and they, they said, oh, he's this creative mind. He, I mean, he's a creative dude. You can tell, but that doesn't mean that it's 
like necessarily good. So um, yeah, Diener killing Eric Young and all that. You know, looks like the, all those all, that's all behind us. Okay, let's move on here. Got to scroll down. Hate reading the results off the website, but like I said, I left my notes in the car. So we got Kenny King after this. Him and Sheldon Jean uh, talking about they have a Heath problem, and it's building up something with Heath and. Unless they cross paths in the call your shot gauntlet, why are they wrestling next week? And that's kind of what I was saying with the go home shows. They have a lot of matches that have nothing to do with people on the card. Why not build some momentum? We'll get we're gonna get into this later because there is gonna be some momentum built for Balfour Glory, but I just think everyone on the card or someone representing each match should get a good win and 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 get some momentum in them. You know, why not? Why are we having matches with people not about not being at Bound for Glory? But Kenny King did an excellent job here, as he always does. I would just love to see him get a, like a real, real run with, uh, with, with a storyline that's meaningful. Because every time he goes into a storyline, I don't expect him to win. After this, G- Gia Miller is talking to Kylan King and because of the over editing, Kylan King looks like she just her head is floating in air with two arms. Um, this at first I was like, what are they doing? I'm a Kylan King fan. I love Kylan King. I've lo- I've loved her before Impact. I always said she was exactly what the knockouts needed. I feel that this girl can have a run at the top of the card. As a champion, I got I I truly feel that about her. This coven thing was horrible. It got a little bit better over time, but she is someone that I think like sky's the limit. You cannot find another Kylan King on the, the indie circuit. And that's why I really wanted her to be a you know to become a knockout because she she has a very unique look. I mean, she has red hair like everyone does in the division, but um I think she's someone that can have matches with Jordan Grace. And if they ever bring Tessa Blanchard back, like she can have matches with her. You know, she she really, really stands out here. But they are talking about the forgotten Taylor Wilde angle where she was attacked. And I say forgotten because they really haven't talked about it a whole lot. And it's kind of a weird story because why would you take – so let me – Fast forward here a little bit. She's talking about a tire iron and Santino, who just happens to be there, shows up out of nowhere and says, how did you know it was a tire tire iron? And um, this was done poorly. This was really bad. But the the overall is that Kylan King was the one who took out Taylor Wilde. I don't know what's going on with Taylor Wilde. I don't know if she's done. I don't know if she's injured. This kind of says she's most likely injured. I think that's more likely the case before her being like done, done. Um, and you got a little angle there if you want want to later on. But King admits that she's the one who took her out. So now we're going to get a um, a singles run. And she blamed Taylor Wilde on losing the tag team titles. I mean, the Coven only ever won when they won the titles and then one or two, def- you know, times they defended it, everything else was always a loss with them. They, I mean, they had a couple wins here and there, but if they wrestled one-on-one with somebody, they always lost, especially Kylan King, which I think is a disservice because I think she's uh, really, really good. But storyline, it also doesn't make sense because why would she take Taylor Wilde out? And then knowing that they're about to go wrestle for the fucking titles or wrestle to be the number one contender, you should say. Jody Threat just so happened to be standing there and made, and you know, it's not like they had a, a plan, the two of them, to attack Taylor Wilde and become a team because they haven't got along since then. So, what the hell was Kylan King, King's plan to go out there by herself? So, like, storyline wise, it makes very little sense, but it's such a nonsense storyline. Like, who fucking cares at the end of the day that they, you know, clearly didn't think much into it? Comments here real quick. Yeah. Um, 
she actually looked like a threat to Camille. She wrestled Camille for the title, I believe. I, oh, man, I'm pretty sure on NWA. I think they had a match. I just didn't get a chance to to watch it. Um, yeah, but she did some... Man, Colin King did some good stuff in NWA, some good stuff in, in AEW. I think she was even... I don't want to say she was signed, but she when AW dark was a thing, she was to the point where she was doing the squash matches. And that's usually a sign of we're probably going to bring you on. So she was definitely very close to that being a thing. And, you know, it clearly didn't happen, but it's, um, and, uh, you know, impacts game, but yeah, she's very, um, you know, she's definitely got, uh, a look like Camille does. I was hoping we could get Camille and impact, but I, I think she resigned with the NWA. She said she was a free agent, but now she's, you know, she she's there. She's on television in Tom Latimer's corner. So I don't think she's she's going anywhere. Um, after this, we had Eric Young. This was the so last week we had the five on five match. The winning team faced this week in a five way, and the winner is going to be number twenty for the Call Your Shot Gauntlet. And the loser of this match was going number one. It was really really clear who was going to win this match last week, and. I was very critical last week because I said, whoever, I don't know what my words were, but whoever put the match together should be lit on fire because you had one team that had two females on it. I understand Kylan King is one of them, but they still had two females on the team. And then you've got another team that has one female and it just so happens to be Jordan Grace. And the thinking was, oh, well, Jordan Grace equals two females. But that thinking doesn't work with you because you're still leaving two females on a team. The only way it makes sense is if that team had six people or if the fem- one of the females, Jody Threat, for instance, was on Jordan's team. That's the only way that makes any fucking sense. So I just thought the whole match was really stupid. Uh, this one here, the five-way. So this is Eric Young versus Jordan Grace versus Champagne Singh versus Jake Something versus Dirty Dango. And this was interesting because, you know, you f- you you got a couple jobbers in here. you got uh, Jake Something that looks like you're going to, start to do something with you got jordan who is a star and is is great at everything and then eric young the forgotten um who you can always insert into main event type very much uh break glass and in case of emergency and i think that's the he's going to play that utility role here in impact i don't think he's going to hold the title i think they're going to act like he's going to challenge for titles but i don't think he's ever gonna i don't think he's going to do um much as a baby face but I guess we'll see. This match was, uh, you know, it was an intergender match because Jordan was in it. It was, um, it was pretty good. Uh, they, Jake, something was the one that got the win last week, so they're they're kind of teasing that Jake is going to win this match or he's going to win the gauntlet. Uh, but Dango was the one that won this won this match. We'll get into how he won here in a second. Um, but Jake, something was the one pin. So clearly, Jake, something going in at number one. Uh, the, he's probably going to have a very long run in that match in, in, in route to like doing something with him. It looks like this is going to be, um, kind of the springboard for him. He had a world title match with, uh, it was a TNA world title match with Moose a couple of years ago that looked like they were taking Jake to the next level. And then he, he essentially did nothing after that. So, uh, it looks like that's where they're going this time around. That's probably one of the reasons he came back, you know, um, that they, they're going to give him some some kind of a push. So Dango wins this match, all right? Uh, and, and the one spot I want to say in this match that was pretty good was when Dango hit the leg drop off the top rope, and I think it was on the back of Jordan Grace's head while she was going for a pin. I don't know how your body can do that move. And not I don't know how you can walk after that. It's It's always been one of the more impressive moves to me when you can hit a leg drop off the top rope. Very few wrestlers i mean aside from dango and like beautiful bobby e and i can't even think of another wrestler who does that so the end of this match all of a sudden you see this big figure coming down the aisle way and this was the one of the fakest things i have ever heard in my life and it was tom hanfin saying her, what the hell her, her, is that who's that is is that and he says, Oleg Prudius. 
which apparently is his real name. I can promise you, as long as I do this podcast, I will not remember that name unless I am staring at it. I have written it down. It is in front of me. I don't even remember what the name is now. Okay? Oleg Prudius. And the way he... You're going to tell me you know this motherfucker's name. I guess if he knows him in real life, that's one thing. But this is not someone who, yes, he popped up on Impact one time before. I would have rather they say, you know, I just say he you used to go by Kozlov. If you don't want to say Vladimir Kozlov, like we, we know him as Kozlov, like what is he doing here? This was like an AEW when John Morrison um, did a, he, I don't remember if it was a run in, it was his debut. And the announcer was like, what, what's Johnny TV doing here? And I was like, do you seriously know what is he, this is a surprise. No one saw this coming, but you know his AEW name already. So I just thought it was the fakest. Just he goes, What's Oleg Prudius doing in the impact zone? Like, I cannot believe he went with that line. What's so and so doing in the impact zone? I cannot believe he did that. It it was it was it sounded horrible. And uh Raywald tried to save it. Because he said, oh, you know, we know him as Kozlov. Like, he knew, dude. It, it, that shit sounded so bad. It seemed like he was trying to save the angle. But anyway, Oleg Prudius. I know I'm saying that because I'm staring at the name right now. I will go to bed tonight, wake up, and not remember what the hell his name is. He, he made his shocking Impact debut. And he's... I don't even remember who he... I think he might have been hitting Champagne Sing or something or Jake something, something. Sorry, I had to hit the Tom Hannum voice there real quick. I don't even remember what he was doing. He delivered a headbutt that did, that came nowhere close. It hit the dude in the shoulder. And then Dango goes for a move. Tom Hannafin gave it a name. I, I don't know if it's like one of his finishers. It was very, very weak. It was less impactful than the majority of the shit they did in the match. But he gets the win. They are saying this is the coveted 20 spot. I don't think anyone's ever won from 20. It's possible. I was saying it's possible Moose was 20. I don't remember, but I feel like he was 20. And I I misspoke last week when I said that two out of the three winners have come from number one. I forgot there's actually four of these. So four, um, four winners. The first two came in from number one. So it's really not that much of a disadvantage. You know, um, statistically, there's a 50, 50% chance of you winning. So, and, and that's based on history. Also, obviously, if Horn Swoggle comes in at number one, he doesn't have a 50% chance of winning. But I'm saying is statistically, drawing number one is a 50-50 shot. Let's see what we got here. I think that makes most sense to have either Giselle or Kylan win the gauntlet. doesn't make sense for any man to win. Moose won Feast of Fire, so there would be two men having the same thing. You know what? That's the most logical way I have. Um, <laughs> I love it. Your name's Ace, and it's got the Ace Austin. That's the most logical take I've heard on this, mat- on this match, and that did not even cross my freaking mind. You're 100% right about that. I've been saying I think this is a, a year for the knockouts. I think it's a year for a knockout to win. Jordan needs something to do, and I think this is it. I think they're going to revisit the Tessa Blanchard shit. I don't think – well, you know what? I was saying that, but that actually counter is counterproductive to what we just said. I said last week if Jordan Grace wins that she's going to go for the men's world title. That was my prediction. But, you know, as you said here, Moose has the briefcase – so maybe it's just maybe she's just going to challenge for the knockouts title. Maybe she's going to ch- check out for the knockouts tag team championships. I, d- I don't know. But I do think it's a year for a knockout. Giselle Shaw. Like Giselle Shaw doesn't beat nobody. She can have 50 people in her corner. She can have every single fan there in her corner. And she will not fucking win. So I don't think it's going to be her. Kylan King would be interesting. That would be like the beginning of a a push because whoever wins this knockouts championship match, 
what the fuck is next for them, right? Kylan King would be a very good impact plus opponent, even though I think they should really build her. Um, but they're right now they're having a hard time building the knockouts because they don't have any jobbers. You know, Alicia's kind of winning some matches now when she wrestles. And then Giselle Shaw, I mean, she's the jobber in the company. Uh, her and Savannah Evans, for the most part. You could say Courtney Rush and, and Havoc. I mean, there I guess there's some people who could do the job, but they're having they're having a hard time right now, I think, building someone outside of you know the main three singles uh wrestlers. But yeah, D- uh, Dirty Dango wins. I just um I have no problem with what's his name? Oleg Prudy is being in this company. I have no issue with it. There's probably some good television that could be done with him and Santino. I don't mean he's gonna do comedy, but I just mean, you know. They're going to run each other to each other in the hallway, and it should be interesting. But just the way that the just the fake shock and the fake like, what, who, what the hell? Who's that? Is is that? I mean, who talks like that? It's funny that his name is still WWE Kozlov on on X, by the way. And we got a really cool, crazy Steve uh, video. He's going to wrestle Black Taurus next week. No disqualification. Um, why isn't Crazy Steve on the Bound for Glory card? I mean, seriously. I, mean, I just cannot believe they're doing him versus Dreamer on the uh, the fallout. Not that I want Tommy Dreamer on the Bound for Glory card because I don't, but Crazy Steve, I think, has deserved that. I think he deserves that opportunity. I think he he I think he really does. I think he he earned that that spot. Um, but it's crazy. Steve's doing the best character work in the company right now. He's been really entertaining to watch. Um, so this was really cool. And the minute he stops talking, they go to the video game whoosh. And that just goes back to like the poor editing, in my opinion, instead of letting certain things breathe. Like Crazy Steve should have finished this and it should have faded to black and they go to a commercial. But instead, it's the stupid sound that they have every 30 seconds on this show. We get uh, Gia backstage with Mike Bailey and the Impact screensavers on the TV. And Mike Bailey issues an open challenge to anyone who thinks they're on the level of Will Ospreay. This was Speedball Mike Bailey's best promo in this company, bar none, hands down. He has sounded horrible the last couple of weeks on the show, talking to Jonathan Gresham and just sounding fake as a $3 bill. He sounded great here. In the Impact Lounge engagement group on Facebook, someone posted a promo that he just cut in New Japan. And this is like two different people, two fucking different people. And I say, why don't they tap into this guy for impact instead of the goof that they have made him when he talks? But he was speaking in Japanese, I believe. And he he had fire in his voice and some bass in his voice, and he sounded clear. Just more of that. What, what he would be, this would be a totally different character, and he'd be further up on the court card if that's the version of him we got, not this version. But I did appreciate that he he was saying he's going to forget about Jonathan Gresham for now and focus on Will Ospreay. So I'm always talking about momentum. I'm always talking about momentum. And he even said it here, you know, I have to go into this match with momentum versus Will Ospreay. So I really appreciated this as a fan. Like, this, I just want to see more, more of this. He issued an open challenge and I would have been fine if he just issued the open challenge, but he had to throw in the words. If you think you're on the level of Will Ospreay, the best wrestler in the world. If you think you're on the level of Will Ospreay, I mean, Kenny Omega is not walking down. He's wrestling Samurai Del Sol next week. That was, that was the answer to the open challenge on the level of Will Ospreay. Should be a fun match. Uh, but this was this is going to be good for for Mike Bailey to get, um, you know, some of the momentum we were talking about. We got Courtney Rush versus Tasha Steeles. We haven't seen much of the Death Dolls lately. They have not really had a whole lot of of TV time. Um, Tasha Steeles got a win last week over 
over Killer Cakes, Killer Kelly. Um, by the way, I'm waiting for Hannafin to call Crazy Steve Steve because if you call Killer Kelly, you know, Kelly, you, you should start doing Steve. I mean, would that not make sense? They're both adjectives and first names. So, like, why why not? You got Killer Kelly, Crazy Steve. Why not? Why not call him Steve? So that was <laughs> probably unnecessary to bring up, but it's just something that crossed my mind. But Tasha Steele's got a good w- a win last week. I got to say, Deanna Perrazzo looked phenomenal um, in this episode. That outfit she had was slamming. Like, she looked great. I was surprised she didn't wrestle in this match, though, because Tasha just wrestled last week. So that's kind of odd to me. But, um, you know, momentum. Tasha gets two wins in a row. Uh, we're going into Bound for Glory with the champions not getting any kind of matches, though. Not any not any kind of wins. So that's, like, really odd to me. The thing about this Courtney Rush gimmick is that Rosemary has an opportunity to actually really wrestle to where – she was limited a little bit as Rosemary. Now she had some good matches. Don't get me wrong, but she, she was, she was limited uh, because she was working within the gimmick and here she has the opportunity to do a little bit more. She, yes. She factors a little comedy in. I thought her doing the Jessica, like uh, you know, Charleston dance and then the elbow or whatever. And I, I thought that was actually kind of funny. Um, and this was, a, this was actually a pretty good knockouts match. I enjoyed watching it. I knew Tasha Steeles was going to win as she did. And I thought the, um, I thought the finish was pretty good. Uh, Courtney Rush at one point forgot she was in a singles match and she was going for the tag. I would have went for the win there. I, I would have had Tasha Steeles at that point hit the cutter, but instead um, Courtney Rush turns around it and got the upper hand. So I didn't understand whoever laid this match out. Why, what was the point of the, Ang- the, the the spot where she was trying to tag out if she just turned around and got the upper hand and, and got the momentum back in the match. I don't know how that makes any sense. Um, but they had a really, really nice uh, closing sequence where uh, Courtney Rush rolled into a cutter, which I f- hate cutters with passion. Uh, it's, uh, it's the new super kick. Uh, but she probably didn't want to go for that crucifix bomb again after it completely bombed last week versus Killer Kelly. So um, very cool. You know, she Courtney tried to go for the spear, hit the turnbuckle, rolled. You know, there was kind of a roll up. She rolled through, got hit with the cutter. Boom, boom, boom. So uh, Tasha Steele, Deanna got some momentum. And this is the match I'm most looking forward to going into Bound for Glory. I will be this week doing a Bound for Glory preview show since I won't be reviewing Impact. But there was going to be a, a preview show, preview and prediction show. So biggest take from that is that Deanna looked great. All right. And then we got some other video packages. Josh Alexander puts me to sleep with these video packages. I mean, it's it's the same shit every single time. Every time. Um, they showed a match of New Japan where Josh teams up with the Motor City Machine Guns and um, why they are wrestling matches of this nature and risking injury, I don't understand. Maybe this match happened a couple months ago. It probably did. It probably did. But um, I think they got to be careful with the type of matches they put their top talent in before pay-per-views. Because even if this happened a month ago, wrestling, you know, Ishii and all these dudes at Josh Alexander wrestling in Japan, doing Japanese strong style, like there's what happened last time? You put them in 50 matches before uh, Slammiversary or whatever it was, Rebellion, I don't even freaking know at this point, and he got hurt. You put um, Steve Macklin unnecessarily in this fucking damn near 60-minute match in the UK. He gets hurt. And I think you do got to get reps. I don't think you 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 it benefits you to go into the pay-per-view cold like you haven't wrestled in a month. I don't think that's going to hurt you. You're, that that going to give you more of opportunity or more. You're, there's a more probability you're actually going to get hurt going into the match completely ice cold. So I think you got to get some people some reps but I wouldn't be wrestling Japanese strong style <laughs> before bound for glory. And I don't even care if this was taped two fucking months ago, uh, but there was an angle where Josh caused 
Alex Shelley to lose the match and cause him to get pinned because he inadvertently hit hit him. Kind of silly, in my opinion. We got a little backstage. Um, Steve Macklin. Uh, he had he had a military a bag, which I don't even know how to explain. It's all it's it's you know it's the color of a duffel bag. I know in the movies like they always have military walking around with duffel bags. Like we don't use fucking duffel bags. We use a bags, which is um. It's almost like a giant round bag, but um, that's what he had that he was carrying his gear in. So I thought that was that was pretty cool. Um, but Bully Ray came in and said, uh, you know, I know you called me soft last week. Did you go in the ring and call me soft again? He goes, yeah. And he's like, all right. And he left. So weird stuff going on with Bully Ray. And then they play the video game sound and play we own the night and there's people screaming and cheering and clapping in the background and and again it's just the same shit like let segments breathe instead of going from one emotion to another so drastically and they're running next week's car down they they run down bound for glory over we own the night like you know like they always do but they run down next week's card we're going to get trinity and mickey james versus giselle shaw and savannah evans this is lazy WWE booking. They have done this. This is the third time in a row that they have done this, except they're not wrestling the coven. They're wrestling Giselle Shaw and Savannah Evans, who are the, the new jobbers and lose every single time. Well, they might win here because they might go with the same exact freaking formula that they did the last time where the two girls had some kind of miscommunication and one of them got rolled up. I mean, that's exactly what they did twice in a row. The same exact match. And you got to figure there's no heat in this bound for, in the, this knockouts title match. None, none, nothing. They're just going to have a good match. It's it's the, the two girls from WWE. One has a newly found fake accent. And I don't I don't expect that match to be particularly good because I don't think either of them are particularly good in the ring. I think they can put together a decent match. I don't think they're bad necessarily, but I don't think they're like either of them are the ring generals that they get the credit for. Maybe more so Mickey James is a little better. I don't expect this to be particularly good because we're talking about two baby faces here. I don't think one of them's gonna wrestle as a heel unless Mickey James's whole fake accent thing is because she's going to, you know, cheat here and there there's some kind of transition. Like she's you know, I mentioned um about god, I don't remember when, but when Josh Alexander came back. And I said, you know, in the WWE when a wrestler is gone for several months and they return, they are never they never re-debut as the same character that left. The music might be different. The gear might be totally different. They might show up with a beard instead of not having a beard or dyed hair or longer hair. There's going to be something. WWE is very good about that. That when someone appears on screen, they change up the presentation. So I brought that up with Josh Alexander because he shows up and he's wearing normal clothes and it's the same bad song. And he just goes, I'm back. And there was nothing... Nothing there. Mickey James has come back from her long hiatus and has this fake accent. So maybe that was her way of rebranding herself. But maybe it's such an annoying fake accent. Like maybe there's a heel turn coming here. And maybe that's what this story is. I don't know. But I, I think it, as of now, on the surface, it's lazy WWE booking. Then we're getting Rhino and PCO joining forces against Moose and Brian Myers. They're doing a Monsters Ball match at Bound for Glory. Rhino, PCO, Moose, and Steve Macklin. This is actually, honest to God, probably the best story on Bound for Glory. The way you're, you're able to intertwine Moose's Call Your Shot gauntlet with screwing um, um, Steve Macklin over, and then Rhino, who's trying to avenge his injury. It's all interesting. I don't know why PCO is in this match or the Bound for Glory match. I know they had the run in last week and Tom Hannafin hurts PCO. Why? Why did he come down? 
they're just shoehorning shoehorning him into the match. And I don't care. They're having a monsters ball match, no stakes. And I I I, I will never understand a multi person match with no stakes. You don't just do like a triple threat match just to do a triple threat match. You know what I mean? There's got to be some kind of implications. Then we're getting um, Kenny King versus Heath and then Crazy Steve in that no DQ match with versus uh, Black Taurus. Main event in the show was the Killer Impact match, which was one of the worst names for a match that I have ever heard. But besides that, this was one of the best matches impact has had and these are two guys that i've been saying as much as i hate watching the same people fight over and over i can watch eddie and frankie gazarian because they can both work there's no rolling around and diving and flipping and kicking at her they're just guys who know how to fucking work and though that's the kind of wrestling that i am into but there's got to be a little of a story too i want to be invested in it two guys can work with a story that is my ideal wrestling match what's funny about this story though is that two matches ago they were like okay this is it we're gonna end it and then they kept going and they had a match and that was supposed to end it and it kept going and the funny thing is when they play this video package last week they showed eddie and frankie say okay this is it we're gonna end it and then and then it shows them continue to wrestle and then it has them say it again this is you know we're gonna end it so this is like the gift that keeps on giving. They just continue and continue. I don't know why this wasn't a bound for glory. Every year, Eddie Edwards is in the fucking gauntlet. I know he won one year, and that was a train wreck after he won. He was carrying around the uh, number one dad trophy from the gift shop. And that was that was a mess. I would imagine both of these guys are in the gauntlet. I don't know why this wasn't a bound for glory. You know, get get yourself a Melter rating for the match. I don't think that they ever clearly identified what the rules were of the Killer Impact match. But Dave Penzer, bless his heart, he sounded very good on this match. The rest of the show, he sounded horrible. And before I get, you know, before I, I kind of get onto the match, I was watching. I think it was Chris Van Vliet. I was watching some of his interviews. He's interviewing Samantha Irvin from WWE, and he asked her, you know, who's your favorite wrestler to announce? And I was thinking to myself, you couldn't have that kind of interview with Dave Penzer because everyone gets the same entrance. I don't know why Jake something doesn't have. He's from here. He just goes next opponent, Jake something like that. Always that one always sounds really, really bad, but everyone gets the same entrance from him. The same ring announcement. I don't even know exactly what you want to call it the same exact way and i thought that just stood out even more because you're actually asking someone right now who's one of the best in the industry at the moment who's your favorite to announce you cannot ask dave penzer that but flipping it instead of being negative on dave penzer he sounded really good here he had a fire in his voice that he used to have years ago like now is completely going through the motions he sounded very good here. He explained the rules that the first fall was first fall to a finish. The second was a submission. And then the third, which is always the third. I've only ever seen one, two out of three falls match that was over in two falls. And the last man standing. I didn't. It, it, maybe they said it last week. I am. I am very positive they didn't, though. They just said, hey, we're going to find a way to end it. And then randomly, here's the fucking rules. They just kept saying it was a killer impact match. They didn't really explain it. Horrible name for a match. Horrible. I understand why they did, but I, I tell you, this company uses the 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 word impact as a crutch. They factor that shit into everything. Come up with something different, like please. But this match was was excellent. The first match, the first fall ended fairly quickly. Uh, Eddie hitting the Boston knee party. I wish he would actually teach that move to Alicia. I, th- I think that would be a good move for her to to use, the Boston knee party. That's actually one of my favorite finishers in Impact because I like the name, number one. Number two, he does a very good job delivering it. And three, I have memories of him hitting that. I was there when he hit Bobby Lashley and won the world title. I have 
clear, fond memory of that. That was a great night. Eddie, I think, actually has the best arsenal of moves and impact for like no one else, the backpack stunner, blue thunder bomb, the emerald fusion, the if that's what it's called, the Boston knee party. Like he's got a lot of moves he uses that no one else is using. This is not like on AEW, everyone uses the same moves. Like we don't have worry about that too much in impact, but you don't see Eddie Edwards doing a DDT and a cutter and a pile driver, the shit other people are doing on the show. He has his own set of moves. And I think that's what really makes him stand out. And I do give him a hard time sometimes, but he's still, he is one of my favorites um, in the company, but he has his own set of moves. And I've, I've always really appreciated that of him, but he hits the Boston knee party is over quickly. And then um, the only complaint about I have about this match is when they're doing the second fall, no one was working any kind of body parts. No one was softening anything up for, for a submission hold. And it dawned on me too. Like Eddie Edwards is not as, as good as he is in the ring. He's not a submission wrestler. Like I really think he needs a submission move. I think if that was in his arsenal, another way he could win a match. I think that would be, um, very beneficial for him, even if it's the freaking single leg Boston crab. Why not just the Boston crab? I mean, it's right there waiting for you to use it. I know it's tough to make a tap out look good doing that move. Uh, Rick Martell's the only one who's ever, I think, effectively done it. I understand Chris Jericho uses the Boston crab, but it's like it doesn't, it doesn't look like it hurts when he puts it on. Now, when he does the lion tamer, okay, now someone someone taps out. But when he's doing like the walls of Jericho, just the more traditional Boston Crab, it doesn't look. It always looks fake when someone taps out. So it's a difficult move to pull out, pull off. You know, just like the I always thought the ankle lock was really fucking fake when people tap out of that. But it, it just shocked me that Eddie actually doesn't have anything in his arsenal. He did do the single leg Boston Crab at one point, but I thought when he hit the backpack stunner and the way that Kazarian just rolled into was that was it the stunner? Yeah, it was. And then Kazarian just rolled up, put him in a chicken wing, and tapped him out. I thought that was excellent. And we knocked the crowd the last episode. We 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 knocked them because they weren't very loud. They they sounded a lot better this episode. I thought they sounded much, much better. Maybe it was editing. I don't know, but it, it sounded better. The only time that was like you could hear a pin drop was when Odarg the Great or whatever his name was, Kozlov came out. You could hear a fucking pin drop. Like the people did not care. They didn't give a flying fuck. Like an abstinent stewardess didn't give a flying fuck. And then the third fall here was last man standing. Very, very freaking well done. Alicia came out at one point looking incredible. She, you check her Instagram because she took like a, a photo in that outfit. <sighs> Wow. Um, but she came out with her kendo stick and she whooped on Kazarian a little bit. And Kazarian put her through a table. And it had me thinking, I think they were trying to tell a story there that he was finally done with Alicia. But I, I don't think it was like really, really effective because I don't think she ever like cost him, cost him to lose a match. I think maybe when they did the, the match at Kilo Kowalski's house, she kind of did. But I mean, like, you know, she got pinned by Tracy Brooks. Like, she wasn't really that much of a thorn in his side. Um, but he takes Alicia out, puts her through a table, and uh, security comes out, and the referees, no phony doctors, no real doctors, uh, put her through a table, and instead of assessing her or putting her on a stretcher or something like that, they just picked her up. And then Kazarian, he got the, he ultimately got the final fall. They, I thought he doing the fade of black through the table was really well done. I thought they were actually going to get a draw for a second. And Kazarian's legs got tangled up. He got tripped up. He um he barely made the count. I don't even think he made the count to be honest. I thought he, um, I thought I thought he um, I thought he was a second too slow. But they gave him the, <laughs> you know, they gave, they gave him the um, the win anyway. But 
but this was one of the best matches. I had said that Rich Swan versus Josh Alexander was my match of the year. Like this is right fucking there. And there might be something in Bound for Glory that falls into that category too. But this was this was really, really good. They they just told a um a very good story up to the point. I think there might have been one one or two matches too many in this whole thing, but um, you know, they 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 did a good job. Um I watched Billy Corgan's interview with uh, Van Vliet or Van Vliet. I'm thinking of Fred Van Vliet and the Toronto Raptors with Chris. Well, he's Van Vliet, right? That's his name. I can never remember. Whatever. I know I said his name earlier, but yeah, I saw his interview. I, I listened to all Billy Corgan's interviews back to when he was with TNA. I always, I always liked his interviews a lot. I don't know why. Um, but yeah, great way to end the show. Just, just great match. This was kind of a bounce back episode. You may have liked last week's episode. I didn't think it was particularly good. I thought this was I thought this was a bounce back episode. So um, you know, props to them for this. We're gonna see what the go home episode looks like. I think they got a pretty solid looking card I could do without PCO and Rhino. Rhino at this stage looks like a fire hydrant with legs. So I don't know how much wrestling he's got left in him. I, I said last week I'm I'm I think he's going to be a producer full time. Like I don't see why you would even put him in the ring at this point. I think they're just finishing off the story with him. But I mean, he looks like a a thumb, you know. Like he's just he's just not in. Um, I don't know. I I don't really want him on my screen anymore. Like I don't want to see Tommy Dreamer. You know, I guess if you use him sparingly, I guess I guess you can make it work. But but yes, uh, fairly good. A bounce back episode and um yeah just to address this uh, billy corgan does that in all his interviews if you don't ask him certain questions he he jokes with you that uh o- almost in a negative way <laughs> he he does that quite a bit so it, it just if he has rapport with someone he'll he'll joke with them like that you know what i'm saying so we're gonna wrap it up because it's midnight uh we went we went an hour here um I will be back this week to preview Bound for Glory. And then, as I said, I'll be reviewing it a couple days after the pay-per-view because I'm getting married the day after. We'll be out of town. Not reviewing next week's episode of Impact because that's the day I'm leaving town. And then at the end of October, which is still a couple weeks away, I will be reviewing uh, the NWA pay-per-view. So... Thanks for checking me out as always, folks. Um, I need to get to bed. So I'm not going to answer anything going on in the (laughs) chat here, but uh, thanks for being involved. Thanks for being engaged. And I'm your boy, and I'm out. Peace.